Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. A big warm welcome to everybody and a huge thank you for joining us for the official Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission is always to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature spanning a whole range of genres to book lovers all around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I am Darren Kazanko, science fiction and horror author, reader, and one of your co-hosts and co-founder of Australian Book Lovers, coming to you today from Corner Country in South Australia. And I'm Veronica Strachan, fantasy, memoir, and picture book writer, reader, and your other co-founder and host for this fabulous episode 15. Do, 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 do. That's right. We're getting mature, <laughs> mat- more mature every episode. Yeah, and you said 12 was one of your lucky numbers, or 15 is one of my lucky numbers. Oh, do tell. I why, but yeah, no, it just was a good number that I quite liked. It's three fives, it's five threes, it's it's a nice odd number. I like odd numbers rather than even numbers. So there you go, 15. Yes, well, I mean, I'm pretty boring. I don't even think I mentioned it last time when I was talking about number 12, but that was only because technically that's the month I was born in, but ah. uh, otherwise I don't, <laughs> I don't really hold any <laughs> special attachment to number 12. But 15, yes, we are, well, we're technically halfway from uh, child to adult as far as uh, podcasts go. So there you go. Yes. We, we've gone through, well, we're probably still in our rebellious stage and uh, <laughs> all right, let's we'll do something completely uh, different. Acquiring finer things. Yes. <laughs> but well, episode 15 and there's so much to, uh, so much to chat about today. We've got some fantastic entertainment coming up. We've got an amazing interview, but how about should we jump in to some news? Yes, absolutely. So let's go local news first. And I'll tell you a couple of bits and pieces that are happening around the nation. The Byron Writers Festival have announced their first guests for their 2021. It's going to uh, run from the 6th to 8th of August in case people are thinking of, uh, you know, getting their tickets and driving or flying up to Byron. So they've got uh, Julia Baird. You might remember that we spoke about her book, Phosphorescence. Um, She's going to appear in some of the festival sessions. Tony Birch, who wrote The White Girl, uh, University of Queensland Press, is going to appear with his new poetry collection, Whisper Songs, and Alice Pung will appear following the publication of her new novel, 100 Days. There's Malcolm Turnbull with his memoir, A Bigger Picture, and Koori poet and writer Evelyn Araluen uh, is going to appear following the 2021 release of her debut poetry collection, Drop Bear, which is fantastic. People may not, may not get that one. Uh, and South African Jewish lawyer Hayley Katzen will discuss her memoir, Untethered. So there you go. So another festival that's coming back uh, that had been cancelled last year and coming back, which is good. And such a beautiful part of the world too, and especially oh. a beautiful part of the country. Though I have to, having to admit, uh, you know, I lived up that way for nearly 10 years, but it's been a while since I've been back. And uh, I think, aren't they doing like reality TV series there now? And it's kind of getting a bit invaded from everywhere. So I, I don't know if I'd, I, I might be a bit shocked going back to Byron now. So I probably wouldn't recognise the place. Yeah, you think you'd be completely different oh i dare say it's it's definitely would have become a lot more busier but i can't say i haven't been for a while but <laughs> well, I, I just got this feeling it's going to be like the jersey shore of of instagram reality oh, now. But, well that's well, that's the image i've been getting through you know rubbish news sources so <laughs> it's, i'm probably talking about something that doesn't exist but I, I wonder if they're going to sneakily give malcolm turnbull dial-up internet just to uh oh. say thanks for the uh <laughs> Yeah, thanks the the, yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, what I do remember, the last person I knew went to Byron was my son who saved, bought himself a combi after he left school and uh, took himself off around Australia. And he called when he got to Byron and said, Mum, I found my people. So he just had, he said there were combis all over the place. People were doing 
all his kind of adventure stuff, you know, jumping off cliffs with paragliders and all sorts of things. So, yeah, lots of people sitting around having chats. So he did love Byron. Uh, but as you say, things change, things move on. Yes, well, one thing that probably hasn't changed, uh, one of the beautiful parts about living that uh, that area, all up the Gold Coast and, and Queensland and northern New South Wales, I think, is one, your board shorts kind of become your uniforms, talking yes. from my surfing days. <laughs> Two, the, the beautiful thing is board shorts also double as pyjama bottoms. And three, the water's warm there. So every day you go for a surf, you're actually washing your board shorts. <laughs> it's, it's, it is just the perfect existence. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything. I'll just leave that one to your wife to talk about your washing. That's fine. <laughs> Poor Yuki is all I can well, say. Well the all I can say is the waves are far more powerful than the, just the gentle swirl of the <laughs> Oh you think the agitation of the uh, the top line <laughs> yes absolutely oh very good all right now this is one i'm going to have a little bit more of a look about so google has banned ebooks on shopping ads the platform's now going to no longer going to allow ebooks as shopping ads and what it means that you know digital books are all going to ads are all going to be disapproved and it includes ebooks in all formats so advertising for physical and audio books uh, will be unaffected because what they're saying is that Google can't provide the best user and publisher experience to meet the high standards for digital books in shopping ads. So it's kind of an odd thing. And I'm, I'm Very not strange. entirely sure why. Where did you find that? Oh, that's this is the first I've heard of it. That is so very, I, very I odd. I saw a mention of it on Twitter. Um, I know Books and Publishing, uh, which has got great uh, insider news, has got an article on it. Because I... I saw a notice come through one of my little news threads. So there you go. So that's something to keep an eye out. So uh, that uh, a company that lives and breathes, yeah, you know, and which is getting why, data okay. and money, and they have their own books, but money. they advertise their books through Google Play. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how it works. Creative Victoria announces their uh, Victorian Arts recipients, which is something that we're going to have a little bit of a look at uh, next year. Um, they're all closer this year, but there are some great literary journals and festivals who got some funding. Um, but there's also access uh, groups, you know, groups that are giving better access to the arts for lots of different um, Victorians. There's lots of authors who've got funds for creative development of uh, novels. Now, I know that I'm a bit Victorian centric and I am sure that there are other states and territories have their creative arts grants and funding so if you've got the link save me some time send me an email and i will have a look because i get lost down all sorts of rabbit holes so the other news is our colleague from twitter holden shepherd so holden is the author of invisible boys he's from wa and he's currently the writing wa deputy chair and he was interviewed by the abc where he was talking about the increase in people writing and reading being a symptom of the pandemic in WA. So he's noticed that um, there are more writing groups around, there are more local books being sold, more people actually writing, because as we know from both uh, TAS Writers and Writers Vic, who we've been chatting to already, uh, Writing WA have got us in their calendar, um, that allowing the programs to be online has really bumped up the attendance of people in rural areas accessing writing resources. So particularly in WA, which is a huge, absolutely huge state, very difficult to get down to Perth or to one of the major centres to go to a workshop. But you can jump online and attend, which is absolutely fantastic. So that's a really good thing. Bunbury author Leslie Thiel said she'd seen more people take an interest in writing. She had her first book published during the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, while she says about it being surreal to hold her, her work uh, in her hands, she said uh, also the popularity uh, of, of writing in rural sector. Yeah, really good. So uh, all pretty good for rural authors. They did really well out of last year because people were more interested in writing, as we know. So yes, there you go. Holden, fantastic. Nice to see you on the ABC. And that, that really is a really good story too, because yeah, look, you know, we make a few jokes and, and there's a lot of dark stuff about, you know, what the last year has brought to us and, and the, the changes and disruptions. It's, uh, 
had upon our lives, but at the same time, inadvertently and, and perhaps even to a certain degree unexpectedly, there's been some uh, gems to come out of the, the the changes that we've had to make. And I think if yeah. one of those changes is a greater level of access for people to to ignite their passion to write or if they've had a passion to write and have felt locked out from that community like i said australia's a huge place like you know we've got far more people spread out all all across you know yes our cities are pretty populated but you know there's a whole population that that doesn't live in the cities and you know to to, for them to be able to especially we're we're talking about this particular instance when it comes to writing Mm -hmm. to be able to become a part and and you know this is happening all across the writer centers of australia now going online just think how many, I uh, can't imagine how many, you know, possibly fantastic authors we're going to now be able to enjoy that we may not have enjoyed uh, without the pandemic because they may not have felt, you know, the, the, the drive to dive into it because maybe they didn't feel they, they were part of that, that world, that writing community, that writing world, or, or perhaps that just that, that little tiny spark that comes from being part of one of the programs, then, you know, yeah, it's, it's just amazing that the opportunity is there for just about everybody now. So no excuses if you've been sitting there going, I've always wanted to write a book. Well, <laughs> then now is the time. That's it. No better time. Absolutely. Two more little items, um, both regarding the Australian Society of Authors. So many authors would have seen or would, you know, would have received their PLR and ELR statements, which is the public lending rights. Um, you may remember that we've spoken of that where if you're, uh, you know, meeting certain criteria, of course, if your books are being borrowed from the library, you're missing out on royalties. So you could be compensated if you register to receive that kind of borrowing fee. So they all came out this week, but this is of course only on physical books So the Australian Society of Authors, who are the ones that really advocated for uh, authors to get this through, are now trying to encourage our uh, governing bodies, our politicians, to do some sort of similar lending rights for digital formats, so audio and e-books. So jump on what I suggest you do if you're an author, and particularly if you're a member, you get straight into the stories, but also jump on if you're just a member of the, the public or any uh, author, have a look at the Australian Society of Authors and support the ASA's digital lending right. So that's one ASA story. The other one that was that I attended, uh, being a member of the ASA, but I attended the Growth in Audiobooks uh, course, which was a a one-hour session. Fantastic session. And uh, that was brilliant. So uh, Radia Chowdhury was there, which is interesting how a person sort of pops into your brain and then before you know it, they're they're over and over again. So Radia was the Penguin Random House commissioning but she also is in charge of their audio books. And what I say to authors is, if you haven't got an audio book, get one, because this is a really good thing. Lots of people are listening to audio books, particularly if your audience is in, shall we just say the younger generation, where they are plugged into some sort of device, uh, you know, for a good portion of the day, they're listening to audio books, they're listening to podcasts. But Basically, what they were saying uh, is that most traditional publishers are looking or have, some of them have got their own studios as Penguin Random House does, and they have their own engineers. So they've gone from having a person doing it, you know, half time to having a small team that uh, run their own productions. Sometimes they do multiple voices. They certainly do uh, effects. Like if people are, the conversation is the person on the phone, well, they will put those kind of filters so that it sounds authentic. They hire the voice talent and do all those kind of things, but you can do it yourself. So the other person that they chatted to was Joshua Hall, who's an indie publisher, and he found his own talent. He hired his own sound booth and got it printed, got the files, and he's selling it from his website himself, which is fantastic. So it was really interesting to see both ends of the spectrum, you know, the the fully supported and the one to do themselves. And yeah, go for it. Because primarily men the biggest group of people listening to audiobooks is men in the 18 to 35 age group and lots around personal development, lots of crime fiction, true crime, and wait for it, fantasy. Yes. So fantasy gets in there. They are the biggest sellers and lots of podcast crossovers. So people who do lovely process or technical or helpful podcasts 
uh, then often ask, well, can you write a book? And so then they write the book and they've already really got the audience built in uh, and the audio book people are used to listening to that person's voice and then away they go. All right. I think that'll do for my news. That's lots. Well, that, that is a lot. And uh, a couple of things from now, thinking with regards to the uh, the, the lending rights uh, payments mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, uh, Possibility PLR, of PLR. Yep. Yes, the PLR, and <laughs> and the fact that you know at the moment that doesn't cover ebooks, and I'm sure that somewhere in there it's, it's due to you know the fact that there's you know physical requirements when you know as in I guess you could say hours you know of of physical work required to stock shelves and lending and all that stuff. Whereas mm-hmm. ebook is quite automated. However, for authors looking to change that, I would recommend contacting whoever's in charge and referring them to you know a good, well-hearted uh, company like something like I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to say with the name, but let's say like a concert ticket seller, maybe <laughs> that uh, they found a unique way to actually charge you for printing your own ticket. Oh. So you know, so that that they work on a model. I'm, I'm pretty sure, and I'm I'm only being half sarcastic here. That anything electronic that requires no human actually is more work, and therefore requires more money from the purchaser. So maybe that's that a little bizarre. It. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you actually, if I remember correctly, you get charged a, a, a convenience fee for being able to print your own ticket. I'm thinking, huh? Oh. Hang on a second. But anyway, nonetheless. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely <laughs> right when it comes to audio books and. Yeah. Um, look, I, I dare say this is going to be a topic that we'll definitely be cross, uh, covering soon, uh, and definitely one I want to cover. It is, it can, it is something that you can do yourself, uh, absolutely. And, and of course, it, look, it's going to be a, a steep learning curve, but it's it's not out of the realms of possibility. It's going to take time and effort, but the the reward at the and end money. will be and money. Yes, well, yeah. if you do it your own, you, you limit it to your money is limited in the point where. Once you've got the equipment, it's just up to your time, tenacity, and patience to yes. possibly <laughs> go yeah. over. I've, I've been told that the uh, looking at it in general, the editing is three times the. So, however long it took to record it, as in the actual recording time for the dialogue, yeah. editing is at least three times that, on, and then obviously you're mastering. But it yeah. is looking. I, I did go through a stage. I got quotes from all around Australia for mm-hmm. audio book production, and I can say, look, you know, the reality is probably. I think that the cheapest I, I got was in the vicinity of eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. Whoa! So it is a huge investment. And again, these right. are these are studios. Essentially, that's their main. That's what they do. These companies is audio book production. So it's was, definitely something. Yeah. It's a big business investment. Yeah. Uh, And depending on what you are looking at, you're probably looking at, um, so a book of sort of some of the statistics are seven to a hundred thousand words is going to take you five to seven days to record, but that is recording no more than four hours a day because it's almost impossible to maintain that quality of voice and the interest and the energy more than four hours. So whether you're, you know, an indie publisher, uh, sorry, an indie author doing it yourself, or, you know, as I said, this was the, um, some information from Penguin Random House, which was really helpful. Yeah. You're, you're looking at taking that long. And then if, as you say, you've got to then edit those hours, well, then that's, you've got to allow yourself six weeks, I reckon, to do that. Yeah. And then of course, if you, if you really want to um, go crazy and uh, as you mentioned before, do little effects for certain dialogue, mm. again, that's having a bit of time, but nonetheless, you know, at the end you get this a fabulous audio book, but yeah, yeah I, I do think it's interesting, but it also blends a little bit with news because I know the, uh, the last couple of news I have been talking about and I'll, it should almost be up by the time this podcast comes out, but our new option to send in short stories of at this stage, 3000 words and under, but as far as audiobooks, yes, it's look for the majority of authors out there. It's probably not something that's, you know, feasible in the next couple of weeks, so to speak. It, it's definitely something that would have to take a, a lot of consideration and a lot of planning, a lot of thought and a lot of, you know, uh, business decision making, whether, you know, pros and cons, whether it is even worthwhile doing. However, saying that, I think audiobooks are fantastic and I think all of our uh, authors at least deserve to have something out there in, in audio format. So mm. part of the reason I will make preview now for getting short stories is we hope to be able to slowly enter into short story audio book production, which will be a lot faster turnaround and will give people the option of getting their short stories turned into an audio format, which can be obviously distributed everywhere as a, as a, 
marketing promotional tool and just form of enjoyment and with you know very little cost involved so and that's uh, i'm hoping that will bring you know a, a whole new avenue of yeah marketing i guess and just adventure to to the writing process so stay tuned that is definitely something we're looking at and uh yes because audio books are just getting more popular every day and and as you mentioned it's a bit of a crossover between podcasts and audio books i think people are just really enjoying listening to content that is either going to inform them or entertain them via via dialogue via words which is mm. you know just the last thing i guess many of us many of us would have predicted back in say 1985 when we thought of the future that it would be the internet would be reading books as in <laughs> audio books that that would be huge <laughs> that and podcasts which is radio so yeah that's fantastic but nonetheless as far as website news um by the time this podcast comes out visitors to the website will have uh, discovered our three new logos and that one is for so we have a wombat um, a mascots a mascot no, yes. no changing the logo on me now i've just got a, I'm not the logo <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry our genre logo mascots <laughs> so uh yes yeah, so we've got the wombat for biography and memoirs yeah. and we've got a possum for a middle grade and we have a awesome snake for ya so, and, that, and the best part is that means there's th we've extended our genres by three already now. So that's excellent. So if you're an author that specializes in middle grade, well, you've now got a home there on Australian book lovers. And if you're a author that specializes in YA of any genre, then we now have a home there for you as well. And of course, for all writers of memoirs and biographies, a special little home for you as well. So uh, very excited about that. And stay tuned. We will be having contests coming up so that we can name our little friends uh, yes. that, that uh, protect protect our authors through the shield of, uh, <laughs> and, and withhold the, uh, the promise against all foes that we will ignite your imagination. But now for, I, I thought I'd also bring up with regards to news, just a couple of little uh, um, writing contests. So yep. I'm, I'm always centered around the website. So I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Now I've uh, it's just a couple of uh, book prize, uh, sorry, book contests that I'd like to let the listeners know about. The information I've got is from the Writer Center, which is uh, can be found at writerscenter.com.au. It, it's it's always it makes things a little bit easier when you go through such a well known and well loved site because you can feel pretty confident about any entering, sorry, any contests that they've got listed there. So the first one I'd like to tell you about is the 2021 Rochelle Prize for Emerging Writers. Now, in partnership with the Emerging Writers Festival, Hatchet Australia and the Rochelle family have launched the 2021 Rochelle Prize for Emerging Writers. Now, this prize is an important industry opportunity for emerging writers, offering one winner an invaluable 12-month mentorship to assist them on their path to publication. The submissions will be judged on the writing and originality of the story, the synopsis and the pitch. Entries close on the 9th of July, 2021, so still a bit of time. There is a word limit in regards to, even though this is for a manuscript, it is for the word limit for the submission. So they're, they're after the first three chapters with a combined maximum total of 20,000 words. They're also after a one-page synopsis, a chapter breakdown of the rest of the work, uh, that would reach no more than two A4 pages long. Once again, that prize is a 12-month mentorship with Hatchet Australia. And if you'd like to learn more, you can visit emerging, sorry, emergingwritersfestival.org.au. That's emergingwritersfestival.org.au. Now, something a little bit different when it comes to a literary uh, contest, we've got the Children's Peace Literature Award 2021. Now, the Australian Psychological Society Limited have opened their biennial Children's Peace Literature Award for 2021. The judges are looking for books for children up to the age of 18 years that encourage the peaceful resolution of conflict or promote peace by Australian authors. Manuscripts must have been published between the 1st of July 2019 and the 30th of June 2021 to be eligible for this award. Now, entries close 31st of July 2021. There is an entry fee of $15 per manuscript. So I'm assuming that means if you have uh, got more than one book that fits in that category, you can definitely have more than one entry. And first prize is an incredible $3,000. So you can learn more if, if for, with regards to that contest by visiting www.psychology.org.au. So that was w's.psychology.org.au. 
www.ecomm.org.au, which is probably not the uh, normal place you'd expect to go for a uh, book contest, but there you go. And the other one I'd like to tell you about is the Hawkeye Publishing Manuscript Development Prize for 2022 which means we've all got Getting plenty of time. Early. Yes. <laughs> now, Hawkeye Publishing has announced their manuscript writing competition is now open for submissions. The winner will receive a prize that aims to guide the author to publishing, sorry, to publishing success, including coaching and editing by Hawkeye Publishing. Entries close 17th of December, 2021, so plenty of time to get writing. There is a word limit for the manuscript of 80,000 words. Now, there is an entry fee on this one as well. It's $45. And again, the prize is author coaching, a structural edit, and a line edit. Uh, so definitely in good hands if you can win a prize there from a company like Hawkeye Publishing. Now, to learn more, uh, you can probably guess this one, it just visit hawkeyebooks.com.au. So yes, once again, hawkeyebooks.com.au. Now, just before we finish up with the news, I just thought I would let our lovely listeners know about a writing event. And, well, not far from Byron Bay, actually, mm -hmm. but this is in line with, uh, well, the subject matter for our guest today. So Romance Writers of Australia, if you're looking to get away and maybe spark a little bit of romance or be inspired by a little romance, then you might like to know that the beautiful Gold Coast is hosting the 2021 Romance Writers of Australia Nas National sorry, Conference, and which is going to bring you four days worth of workshops about romance, craft, business, marketing, and research. So pretty much everything you need to know. Uh, the venue is going to be Mantra on View in Surface Paradise, and I suspect I've stumbled past there a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if late at night, there's a few glowing things on the concrete that may still be a few of my brain cells from. Ah. Uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> so no. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the dates for this uh, excellent little conference is going to be the 13th to the 15th of August of obviously 2021. So that is the Romance Writers of Australia National Conference. So if you're a romance writer, if you're looking to get into romance writing, if you'd just like to discover what it's all about, you know, whatever your interest might be, what an opportunity to hit the Gold Coast um, in a perfect time of the year. I think if I'm remembering correctly, it might even be near the, the Winter Sun Festival might be close to there as well, but if that's still going on, but it's still beautiful, beautiful time of the year to be there. And uh, so that is on the third, between the 13th and the 15th of August. And you can learn more by visiting romanceaustralia.com. So there we go. That is the news for today from myself. Heaps of news, fantastic and very appropriate for romance because our author interview today is Sandy Barker. So Sandy is a writer and a traveller with a lengthy bucket list and a cheeky sense of humour. So this is what she tells us on her website. And Sandy is a romance novelist. So you may remember from episode seven, Sandy was one of our fabulous panellists in the romance panel special that we ran. And her books are travel or holiday romances and she's got One Summer in Santorini, That Night in Paris, and A Sunset in Sydney. She's also got a standalone Christmas novel, The Christmas Swap. And I'll tell you about her other novels after the interview. So without uh, more ado, lots of laughs with author Sandy Buck. Yes, absolutely. It was a fantastic interview and can't wait to share it with uh, all our awesome listeners. So as you mentioned, without further ado, here's Sandy. And welcome, Australian book lovers. I have with me today, absolutely delighted that I've got her here, is Sandy Barker. Now, Sandy is a writer, traveller, and hopeful romantic with a lengthy bucket list. Many of her travel adventures have found homes in her novels. She's also an avid reader, a film buff, a wine lover, and a coffee snob. Now, she lives in Melbourne, as you would have guessed, from being the, the coffee snob. It's where all good coffee snobs live, with her partner, Ben, who she met while travelling in Greece. Their real-life love story inspired Sandy's debut novel, One Summer in Santorini, the first in the holiday romance series with one more chapter, an imprint of HarperCollins. So Sandy's currently working, or and I think her fourth novel is out, The Christmas Swap, and that's a standalone and celebrates her favourite time of the year. That's a mouthful, but Sandy has many strings to her bow. Welcome, Sandy. Well, it is an absolute pleasure <laughs> to be here. Thank you very much. That's a, yeah, that's a, it is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Did you think a few years ago that you would be doing interviews and talking about the four books that you've published? 
I, I know that just kind of it. No, I didn't actually. It's one of those things that you really hope about, hope, yeah. ho- hope for, you know, and I'm one of those people who, if I'm driving by myself, I might, you know, do a little practice interview, you know, pretend I'm on Oprah or something, oh, but, fabulous. Um, you know, that's, <laughs> That's because this has been a dream for so long, but no, really, um, it's, it is just a dream come true. And I think when, you know, our writing community sort of came together, mm. um, the Oz Rights writing community, and we were all just, you know, we we're all emerging and, um, you know, I'm sure this was the sort of thing that was a pipe dream for you as well. Yes. And um, you know, starting this website and bringing this community together in a, a formal space is just brilliant. So, yeah, it's really kind of dreams are coming true all over the place. They so. are. Thank you. And, and that is good. And we did end up meeting oh, ages ago. And I think you had just had your announcement that you were you'd been picked up by your publisher. Yes, that's right. That's right. And I remember, I mean, it was great to kind of meet people face to face who are part of this wonderful community that's online. Yes. Um, and I remember the, the, the look on people's faces, including yours, I think it was like, hang on a minute, you self-published, you self-published these books and then you got a publisher with the same books. Yes. And that was actually, I, I was a bit cheeky, actually, now that I think about it, when I started querying the books that I'd self-published because I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. Excellent. Um, <laughs> but I think that what that highlighted is that the world of publishing has changed a lot and that there are no rules really anymore. If you can find a home for your books, no matter what, even if they've been out in the world before, if you've self-published, that's there are publishers who are willing to do that and to take on authors. And also the world of independent authors is just flourishing. I mean, it's such a fantastic avenue to getting books out there in the world and getting them in front of readers. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, that, that get together was fantastic because we also span so many different genres Yes, um, And it was great to find out what was happening kind of in crime fic and YA and speculative fic. And yeah, so um yeah we did we met a few years ago and we've been um we've met a couple of times since too that's nice but yes. it's it's just such a wonderful supportive community across all those genres it is isn't it despite the fact that writing is such a, a solo effort uh in in lots of ways many hours on your own you know pouring those words on paper the community is tremendously supportive absolutely yeah so sandy talking a little bit about the romance industry uh, romance writers industry now that is a huge part of publishing and and reading all around the world what decide was there a decision a conscious decision to go into the romance genre or is that what your stories came from yeah that's a yeah um yeah that's chicken and egg isn't it yeah (laughs) Um, i mean i've always been a prolific reader of romance yeah my you know i was the little precocious 11 12 year old stealing my mother's mills and boom (laughs) off the bedside table um and then you know by the time i was in my mid-teens i'd moved on to the jackie collins very precocious reading um so i've always really enjoyed kind of women's fiction and and romance as a genre and you know as the teens in australia we read the sweet Um, Valley High and the Sweet Dreams books etc so I was really really familiar with the genre and kind of the um, foundational tropes associated with the genre Mm -hmm. and I read a lot of um, some authors don't like this term but I love it I I read a lot of chick lit Mm -hmm. Um, and it just kind of you know when I when I was writing my first book that's out now I just had a story to tell and that was the genre it it fit into. Um, I wrote it to be kind of funny, but have a a through line of heart and, you know, that self-discovery and of course the romantic themes. So it's, it's a little less like some of the, some chiclet that's out there and kind of more focused on kind of the travel themes and self-discovery, but then that romantic piece as well. So yeah. You know, there's that expectation when you're writing romance to have either the happily ever after or happy for now. Yes. Um, yep. So my first book is kind of a happy for now. Um, mm-hmm. And then I wanted to continue that story. So there's there's two more in the series that are already out there. And I've got two more coming. <laughs> Excellent. Two more coming in the same series? 
in the same series. Yeah, Ooh, yeah, that sounds good. Does that mean you might need to do a little bit more research travel when, of course, conditions allow? Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. So last year was supposed to be a big travel year for me. And, you know, I, look, I only write about places I've been to. So mm-hmm. that did actually inform kind of book four and five. Book four I've written already um, and it's set in Bali. Ooh, which lovely. is a place that I lived in in 2018. So I kind of am like, right, where have I already been that I can write well enough? And book five will be set in Tuscany, which is a part of the world that I love, love, love and feel like I've been to probably enough times that with some desktop research and going back to my travel journals and photographs mm-hmm. that I'd be able to do it justice. Yep. But, yeah, I I definitely i am itching itching to travel again and Uh, get a completely new place uh, you know on the list so that I can write about that (laughs) very good where where is the top of your want to go list oh yeah (laughs) well (laughs) I mean yeah it's just so hard it's so hard I think realistically because travel to New Zealand is you know sort of open and and I think it's going to be open more broadly Mm -hmm. First, I mm. think that New Zealand will be on the list um, number one. That's beautiful. Just because it's the most realistic. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, you know, oh, go on. Sorry. I was going to say, travel is very much a part of your life. So you've got a, a travel blog. You've been a Kentucky tour manager. So tell us a little bit about how you got into having that travel bug. Well, my, I'm, I'm blame my parents. Okay. Um, it's Good a to very tell. expensive yep. pastime. <laughs> All their fault. Um, my parents are both military children. So, um, you know, my mum calls herself an army brat and my dad, um, my dad's dad was in the Air Force. So they always travelled around in, the, in their childhood and lived around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my dad lived in the Middle East and he and my mum lived in Germany and, they you know, anyway. So all, when we were small, we always travelled. Uh, my first international trip was when I was seven and they just kind of always instilled in both my sister and I this sense of adventure and this sense of the importance of travel to mm-hmm. gain perspective and to learn about other places and people and cultures. And, you know, there's there's not only what are the differences, it's what are the similarities, what kind of makes us all yeah. people, you know, what are, what are the common threads between us all. Mm-hmm. So th- that was always part of my childhood. And, uh, you know, I lived overseas when I was, I've lived overseas quite a few times, both in the UK, um, in, in, in the US and um, m- more recently in Portugal and Bali. So it's just, it's just in my blood, I think. And I think the things that happen, the good things that happen in your childhood often become your passions Mm -hmm. yes yes. (laughs) and that's really you know that's that's I think that was the seeds were planted very early um and I feel very antsy if I don't travel very very (laughs) okay so this has been difficult for you this last little while then for sure I've done a lot of armchair travel let's Ah, put it that way very good (laughs) very good lots of documentaries and (laughs) um, travel shows and reading travel fiction um Ah. a lot of armchair travel yeah So the other thing that is very much in evidence in your book, and I can attest to um, one summer in Santorini being mouth-watering, there is a lot of food in your books. (laughs) Yeah. Can you tell that I like to eat? (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, you come from Melbourne, of course. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm from Melbourne. And, um, yeah, yeah, I I am a big fan of food um, and I love local cuisine. And, um, yeah, I do think that that's a really important part of travel. Mm -hmm. And in Greece in particular, my goodness, Greece is one of my favourite, favourite places to eat in the world. It's like, where do you like to eat? The entire country of Greece. Um, (laughs) The food is... I, I, it's it's unbel- like the tomatoes they were the best in the world mm. like they just I don't know if it's the special Greek sunshine or mm. what but just a, a well-made horiatiki salad that Greek salad is just heaven I seriously could live on that for the rest <laughs> of my life every day um, and when we when we're there we eat them twice a day so it's like lunch and dinner you know mm. and you know lamb and and roasted goat and these oh just it, it's endless and I could pontificate for hours just on food. <laughs> but yeah, I, I find that that's such an important part of a travel experience. Mm. 
is the food. What does mm. the what does this country taste like? That's mm. that is really really evocative when you're um, writing somewhere that people haven't been to or maybe they have and want to be reminded of. If you can tap into exactly what it's like to eat there, yes. that just kind of is you know that it, that it makes the setting kind of come to life even mm. more. I think mm. absolutely. All right, so tell us a little bit more about the stories themselves. So pretty easy one here, but anything <laughs> specifically Australian about your books, and obviously there's a stack, but walk us through where some of the Aussie parts come in. Well, absolutely. I mean, my main characters are Australian. So the main character in One Summer in Santorini and then the direct follow-up is called A Sunset in Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's called Sarah and she is – you know, th- you know, I say that this is a semi-autobiographical story. Mm-hmm. Um, so she has a lot of similarities to me probably 15 years ago when I was in my 30s. Um, and she's a hopeful romantic, a bit like me, but she's also, well, she's a bit of a mess, quite frankly. <laughs> um, and she has a terrible breakup and she takes herself on holiday. It's, you know, t- tale as old as time. Um, she takes herself on holiday. She's on a man diet. She's like, you know, or a drought. Like, she, I'm just stay away from men. So, of course, <laughs> What happens on this sailing trip in Greece is she meets two men and they're very, very different and they bring out different things in her. Mm. Um, So she's, you know, her being an Australian is really an important part of the storytelling because we, I think Australians are very intrepid people and I think Mm. that travel is a huge part of our culture here. Mm. So that that definitely kind of um, the whole idea of just going somewhere completely different to to fix your broken heart that's not that's not that's not alien to us so Mm. I think that her being an Aussie is you know she's very Australian and how she approaches things and very what you see is what you get and um she's forthright and funny and self-deprecating so um that's that character Um, her sister is the main character in the second book which is called That Night in Paris and she's an Australian who lives in the UK but you know, you can take the girl out of Australia, but you can't take Australia out of the girl. So she's got some of the same characteristics. Um, and that that book actually brings up a lot about her um, upbringing in Australia and um, kind of a blast from the past, a person that she reconnects with who she was really good friends with in Australia in high school. So um, the characters being Australian is really important. And as I mentioned, the third book is called A Sunset in Sydney. So we're back home and, you know, Sarah's in, in her love triangle, both mm-hmm. are long distance relationships. Um, and a lot of the book takes place in Sydney, which is a city I lived in for nine years and love. It's a little bit of a love letter to Sydney. <laughs> yeah. And then the Christmas swap is actually about, Three girls who meet when they're on holiday at aged 11, one's American, one's British and one's Australian. And um, they grow up best of friends and they travel together. And one Christmas, they decide that they will all swap Christmases. So they're not going to spend it together. They're actually going to spend it with each other's family. So a third of that book is actually set in um, Melbourne and surrounds. Um, So, yeah, Australia is really prominent in my books. Uh, Definitely. So how well are the books received with international readers? Really well, actually, because mm-hmm. um, the my publishing house, One More Chapter, is an imprint of HarperCollins UK. Mm-hmm. I actually I queried them when I was living in the UK in 2018, and so that's kind of my primary market. Um, and so, you know, I've got a char- I've got that British character in the Christmas swap called Lucy, and I want to make sure that she's really authentically British. I chose I chose England as a as a um, location in that book because I'm half British. I've got a British passport and British citizen. Um, my dad's my dad's British, and I've lived there. My sister lives there. My great aunt lives there. um, And I've had Christmases there several times. So I thought, well, that's a Christmas I know and can write really well. Yes. Um, So that, that was, that book is, was very, very well received in the UK, particularly Mm -hmm. because it came out at a time when none of us could go anywhere really. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was quite aspirational for the, the British readers. It's like, oh, you know, if we could go to Australia for Christmas mm-hmm. or the UK for, I mean, or the US for Christmas. Um, but Some yeah, of that I, travel. 
Absolutely. It's yeah. the armed care trouble. Mm. And once I'm in Santorini was well received because I, I think just because of the themes, you know, I, again, that, that common, the commonality between us, even though we're all in different countries is, you know, we all fall in love. We all have heartbreak. Humor is kind of transcend, you know, transcends um, country borders. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, and that theme of kind of digging in and finding yourself. So yeah, I would say most of my readers are British, which is again around that being my primary market but mm -hmm. um and i've had some great great feedback as well from the, um american readers mm -hmm. the christmas swap it was really kind of did the best of the my four books so far in the u.s and i think that being set one of a third of the book being set in colorado had a lot to do with that excellent have you done some traveling over there Yes, yes. So my mum's American and I've actually lived there quite a few years. So <laughs> there I've, we go. I've lived in the States for I think all up about 12 years, 13 years, a lot of my yes. life. Um, and I had a fantastic Colorado Christmas one year with a dear friend of mine. And I thought, oh, I want to write that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. And, it sounds good. Oh, I know. And I, there was a gal who reached out to me after she'd read the book and I was so chuffed she said look i'm british i live in oxfordshire that's where you know christmas swap is set mm -hmm. i have had christmas in breckenridge colorado in <gasps> fact my family has a holiday home there and i did a um i did an exchange at university in melbourne and she <laughs> said you have transported me to all three locations Aww. so well and i was like Oh, oh, that's so lovely. You, thank you, thank you. She's like <laughs> my, my special target audience of one. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. If you had to put an avatar in your mind, she's the one. She's oh, the one. Very good. Anyway. Now, the Christmas Swap is doing extremely well and has just been mm. nominated as a finalist in the Australian Romance Readers Award. So tell us about that. I know. I'm so excited. Yeah. So the Australian Romance Readers Association is wonderful association and it's very, um, you know, self-explanatory, the mm -hmm. name of the group. So it is um, entirely run by volunteers. They're all romance um, readers around Australia and in New Zealand. And these awards are nominated and voted on by the readers. So mm -hmm. it's not it's not the sort of award that an author just kind of goes, here is my book for consideration. Right. Um, so to be shortlisted as a finalist for favourite holiday or Christmas book, I was blown away. It just, it was, yeah, I'm very, very, very excited. <laughs> That's so and good. I know it's a cliche, but it really is just an honour to be nominated. Oh, that is that is lovely. Um, so when is the final draw of the, the winners? So they are closing voting on March 6th, 6th mm -hmm. and I think it's the 21st of March. So, um, yes, oh, my goodness, that would be <laughs> – it is an, an honour to just make that list because there are – you know, there's Liz Fielding, who is a British writer, and she's brilliant. She's been writing for a long time, and she's on she's on that short list. Um, Christina Loren, who is a writing duo out of the US, and then all of these fantastic Australian authors as well. So it's Australian authors considering kind of a global pool of Christmas books, and I'm ah, like, wow, okay. okay. Yeah, that yeah, it takes it up another notch, isn't it, when you it are there yeah. in, in the global pool? Fantastic. Yeah. That's really yeah. good. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. So, so great. <laughs> and that's good. And as Sandy, um, I also have to say that your other books are also doing particularly well. You've got bucket loads of reviews and you're often in the in the bestseller on, you know, Amazon lists and those kind of things. What is it that you and, you know, perhaps um, you know, your your publishers as well, what is it that you do to promote your stories and get them in front of readers? For sure. I think it's a really important, um, well, I know that a lot of indie authors will be across pretty much all of the strategies that I use personally, because mm -hmm. um, they're often much more um, social media and marketing savvy than I am, but it's a partnership. So the publisher will sometimes discount the books and then kind of advertise through BookBub or Amazon um, and say this book is on sale. Mm -hmm. So that's um, that often we'll see a spike in sales, which is really great because that will go out in, you know, it'll either be in 
you know, ads that appear on the site or will be in kind of that mail out. But from my, my side of things, I um, have to maintain a strong social media presence Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and I have my own blog and I like to be part of that author community because we have this wonderful, particularly in the romance authors, we're very all very supportive of each other. There is that mentality of as the tide rises, all boats rise with it. Mm. So we are lifting each other up constantly because people who read romance in particular don't just read one book a year. They yes. might read 10 or 30 or mm. 50 books mm. a year. So they're constantly looking for new authors. They're constantly lo- looking for new titles. So it's just, it's a wonderful way for me to contribute to that community is I will post on my blog. I'll have, I'll have author interviews on my blog mm-hmm. um, or do cover reveals or that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's just kind of being, just kind of keeping the, um, the conversation alive. So engaging with readers if a reader tags me on social media, I will always reply if I get emails or what have you and just say mm-hmm. thank you. I really, I do appreciate hearing mm-hmm. from them. Like the gal who, you know, my, <laughs> my target reader of one, like yeah. that was just made my day, you know. Oh. So anytime I get tagged or anything, I'm just so appreciative and just kind of constantly trying to get my, I don't want to, I don't want to come across as I'm constantly saying, hey, buy my books, but yeah. Um, it's it's really more about just being a presence in mm-hmm. the reading and writing community. Like mm-hmm. Sometimes I just post a silly meme and people go, that's hilarious. You yeah. know, I've <laughs> given them a laugh for the day. Yeah. So I think it can be a fine balance because I know I, I sometimes get frustrated every time I see a particular author on social media, it's buy my book, buy my book. And I'm like, yes. okay, I I loved your book. It was great. But what else is there about you? You know, like, do you travel or do you have pets or whatever? Mm-hmm. So that's what I think is kind of fun is that you, through social media, you um, kind of get to know other authors as, um, and me as a reader, I get to know who they are as people. It's like, um, you know, if they post pictures of here's my trip to Sicily and then, oh, and you go, oh, that, that you know, they have that great book about Sicily and what have yes. you. Yeah. So it is It is really kind of, um, and I'm learning all the time, but it is trying to be just not too pushy and in people's faces. But, you know, we're coming up on a weekend. We've got lockdown in Melbourne again. It's like, <laughs> hey, what are you reading? <laughs> here's, a, here's a mom chair travel for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And But you're right in that being a part of the community and letting people see a little bit behind the author photo is very important. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I mean, we're people. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so let's look a little bit more about the writing. Where do you write? Are you an early morning or a late evening or are you writing full time? Tell me a little bit about your writing process. Sure, sure. I used to write in the evenings after work mm-hmm. and I found that it was very much a chore because um, I work in um, for an education company and a lot of my day-to-day stuff is um, very taxing on my mm-hmm. thoughts <laughs> and my my brain essentially so it's a lot of you know um cognitive work yes so I would sit down to write and I and I was finding that very difficult to just kind of squeeze out some words so I decided to flip that on its head and I actually get up early now and I usually write or edit before work Mm -hmm. so I will get up between five and six and I will work for two or three hours and then I kind of switch literally switch laptops put one away, bring the other one out and then go to my day job. Sometimes I get inspired and I might write a little at lunch or Mm -hmm. I might write after work and I do spend, I mean, during lockdown, it was Mm -hmm. every weekend, all weekend, but I do spend a lot of my weekends writing as well. Mm -hmm. And I self-impose my deadlines. So at the moment, I, my next book for my publisher is not, it's not really due yet, but I'm, I'm, I want to get it done by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. I want to, um, and that means written, revised, revised again, tweaked, edited, checked for the overused words, read again, like all of those checks. I read it through like six or seven times before I send it. So I'm on number seven at the moment. That's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. I, I just want to draw a line under that so I can start March in March, start something new. Very good. And so what are your writing goals then for the rest of the year? So it's obviously get, book number seven out 
Well, this is um, – oh, I meant – sorry, I meant I'm on pass number seven. Oh, on pass number seven. Um, okay. So I've, um, I've actually written books five. Five is – I'm considering that ready to hand over. Okay. And book six um, is the one that I'm just finishing now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not quite sure because we're still working out the publishing schedule, but it looks like um, this year is, book six is going to come out. Mm-hmm. And that's a standalone. And then next year, um, my, the one that I wrote fifth, my fifth book that I wrote is mm-hmm. is going to come out. That's the next in the series. Oh, and then yeah. there's another in the series to write. And um, then I will, it looks like I'm going to be writing a follow-up to the Christmas one. Ah, very good. Yeah, not for this year. That will be for next year. Okay. Um, but, yeah, the, the three characters were really well received. So um, I've got a really great idea for bringing them all back together again. Ah. Oh, very good. Um, I can yeah, feel the plot so, thickening. So it looks, in, you know, in the next, I think in the next like 18 months, we're looking at four and two, two nearly two done. So, yeah, I'll get, I'll get cracking on the next one. Very that. good. <laughs> can you see a time in the future where you'll write full time and you'll be able to, you know, give up yeah. or you'll choose to give up your day job? Some people really enjoy the balance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the moment I've actually gone part-time. So I'm only four days a week now Mm -hmm. as of the start of this year. And that was to free up more time for writing. So I write all day on Fridays Mm -hmm. and I can foresee, yeah, I think I I would like to aim by the end of next year or early 2023 is actually giving up my um, professional at the job. I don't want to say professional because I feel like I'm a professional writer. Yes. Um, and I don't like saying day <laughs> job either because it makes it sound like I don't like yeah, the job. The reading's um, a hobby, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the job I do during the day, um, yes. I feel like I will I will probably give that up mm-hmm. at some point in the next, yeah, I think year and a half. Mm-hmm. That's my aim. That's what I'm hoping for. Maybe, yeah, this time – in two years, I would hope that that's kind of that's where we're at. Um, but you know, I I work in education and I'm a career educationalist. That's a yes. hard word to say. Yes, <laughs> um, a career educator. So I I think I will always have a hand in that. Yeah. But I yeah I really look forward to writing full time. Yeah. <laughs> I How just much... love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> How much has your additional writing your your fiction writing influence what you do in the education setting is is that there been a bit of a crossover have you found yourself checking colleagues out for thinking you'd be a good story or i must put you in a book oh that's that's so interesting Uh, well the first part of that question i thought well my i i do get tapped on the shoulder to do a lot of editing at my my other job (laughs) um i Look, I am a shameless, shameless stealer of stories. Excellent. So if you tell me a good story, a good anecdote, you know, that makes me laugh or mm-hmm. you know, I shamelessly steal those from my books. So yeah. I feel like they're fair, fair game. And yeah. <laughs> um, In the public and domain, I, as they say. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then, you know, if I'm, I'm creating characters from scratch. You know, we're making up people in our heads. That's what we do. We do, yes. But, but I will, I will sometimes kind of think, ah, oh, they're kind of like that person or that person. And of course, if you're going into an office where there's several hundred other people, mm. like um, I did pre-COVID, there's a lot of there's a lot of material there. Yes, mm. so absolutely. <laughs> there's, you know, the way that person walks or the way that person talks or the way that person's particular about such and such or whatever. I think that that's those little nuggets that create, that make up a character are, are they're fantastic. Yeah. It's fantastic. And so, yeah, I do pay a lot of attention to things that maybe other people don't, mm. non authors don't. I'm sure mm. you do when you're out about people mm. watching as well. <laughs> people watching is fascinating. Now, Sandy, you said that you read a lot. What do you read? I mean, as well as the romance and admitting that you borrow your, mm-hmm. your mother's uh, Mills and Boons when you were young, what mm-hmm. holds your interest now? Well, I do still read a lot in the genre I write, mm-hmm. on, write in, and I like good travel fiction. Um, but quite honestly, my, my favourite thing to read is gruesome crime thrillers. Ooh. Yeah, like the, <laughs> the more gruesome, the better. The, 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 
Yes, I yes. love those. Mm. I love the Nikki Frenches. I love the Patricia, Patricia Cornwall. Yes. yes. Oh, love, yes. love, 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 <laughs> love, love. And I love actually, I love detective series. Mm-hmm. Like Michael Connolly writes detective series that I've read every single one. And I love these characters so much. And his writing is so, so different from anything that I do or what I, you know, that the genre I write in because mm-hmm. he's so succinct so succinct and denotative and I love it I mm. love it up I will read a book of his in about I'll just devour it in an afternoon I'm like mm-hmm. darn it when's the next <laughs> one coming out six months that's outrageous <laughs> uh, so, and he's he's prolific he actually puts about, out about three books a year so uh, um but yeah I i as soon as someone says oh I've got it I've got a new crime fiction author for you I'm like who who and I start <laughs> reading the back catalog <laughs> I'm a binge reader. A Some binge people are binge watchers. I'm a binge, binge reader. reader. Yep, absolutely. Very good. So, Sandy, what words of advice do you have for an aspiring author? Because I'd have to say, I, would you say that you're established now? Would you give yourself that kudos? I I do feel like I'm established now in that um, I'm not querying. Mm-hmm. Um, I do... I do still have to do the thing where I have to pitch to my publishing house. Like I'm not, mm-hmm. I, you know, they don't go, a given. just wonder if anything, it's fine. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I still have to come up with ideas and I work with my agent and I, you know, we, we're strategic and I say, okay, here's a synopsis for this, that, and the other, and I get feedback on that. And so in a way I kind of am pitching, but I'm not mm-hmm. trying to find a home for myself as an author. Mm-hmm. So in that way, yes, established. I think with... um emerging authors there's it's two sides of the same coin so um, being an author is the work the Mm -hmm. writing and the advice there is to make the time I think I you know I meet people (laughs) this this is it's not it doesn't happen very often but you meet people and they go oh yeah I I've always thought that I could write a book and I'm like, okay, well, that's great. <laughs> have, you, <laughs> have you sat down and have you sat down and done it or is there just a story in your head or what yeah. is it? So the number one thing is you must sit down or stand up, whatever I have a stand yes. up desk and write. You have to get the words on the page. Mm. You absolutely have to tell your story. And even if you don't know how it fits together, how it's going to be a narrative, um, how you're going to structure it or what have you, if a scene comes to your head, sit down and write it. Mm-hmm. If a character comes to mind, write the character profile, just write it, get it out because you, you, you know, there's that old adage. I think it was, it's Neil Gaiman or Stephen King or somebody said, you can't edit a, a blank page. Yes. So yeah. that is the, that is the number one advice is to tell your story. You have to write it. You can't apply any of the rules or tropes or edit or whatever, unless it's on the page. So get it down. Um, When it comes to the other side of being an author, which is the business of publishing, Mm -hmm. it's really to educate yourself as much as possible. It is find out who who are your competing authors? Mm -hmm. Where do you want to see your book on the shelf? Who is going to be next to you? All right, who publishes them? Um, Who who is like that, but doesn't have an author like them. So you're actually doing the research on who to be targeting when you're going to um, publishing houses or you're going to agents, like who, you know, who is an agent who's accepting queries, but also is looking for, for an author in your genre. So you've got to know who it is that you're talking to. It's a bit like applying for a job. You don't just send out your resume to everybody. Mm. You have to target who it is that you want to work with Mm -hmm. and who will want to work with you who's open and who's open to what you are um, putting out there Mm -hmm. so once you've done that then I think the importance of the synopsis and the query letter cannot be emphasized enough if you want if you want to go down traditional publishing route your synopsis and your query have to be the best writing you've ever done Mm. because that's what will that's what will get the publishing house or the agent to read your work and they they're smart about it so they can see through typos they can see through maybe structural errors or grammar or what have you if you've got a voice and you've got a great story to tell they can work with you because they will edit your work but if mm-hmm. you don't have a good query letter and a good synopsis 
they're never going to look at your work. Mm. So I think that is the most, most, most important thing if you want to go down the traditional route. And if you want to be an indie publisher is make sure you are either a really, really good editor yourself or um, get someone, a trusted person or hire someone to edit because just having that perspective on your manuscript. And when I was self-published, I did have, I did have my work edited externally. It's really, really great to have that perspective on your work just to make it as good as it possibly can be. And then you've got to kind of learn about that. How do you get your book out there? The marketing side of things. And there's so many different ways that indie authors can do that and do that. So I think that those are the things. It's the business really and the work is get the work done. And then you've got to be really strategic about how you get it into the right people's hands. And if you're in the, an indie author, that's the reader's hands yes. directly. So, yeah. Fantastic. Lots and lots of good advice there. Thank you. A pleasure. I hope that wasn't too... I, was, I got, get a bit passionate about that. <laughs> I can tell, but that's fantastic because that's what we've got at Australian Book Lovers. We've got passionate authors and we've got passionate readers. So the Australian book industry, I think, is safe. It's, it's, I've been yeah. reading um, a little bit about, you know, what the future of it uh, holds for the next couple of years. And certainly um, it's on the up and up. It's certainly not going anywhere. So no. Sandy, thank you very much for your time today. And I hope that our listeners have enjoyed hearing all about Sandy's journey. Where can the uh, the readers find you online? Um, I would say um, sandybarker.com. Mm -hmm. That's probably the easiest to remember. And then that's got links to all my um, social feeds. And you can follow my blog if you like, if you like to hear about writing and other authors and travel, um, sometimes food. Um, yeah, but sandybarker.com and then that just talks about all my books as well. So you can kind of see what I'm up to. Thank you, Sandy, very much for your time. My pleasure. So this is an excerpt from my first book called One Summer in Santorini. It's also the first book in the Holiday Romance series. And we're joining Sarah. She's had a terrible heartbreak, a terrible breakup, and she's taken herself off to Santorini. And she's about to join a sailing trip well, that, where they'll sail around the Cycladi. So chapter three. As the bus lurched along the dusty, winding roads of Santorini, I watched the cute American with considerable interest from behind my duty-free Prada sunglasses. He seemed anxious, as though he might be on the wrong bus or something. For all I knew, I was on the wrong bus. I realized my usual MO would be to panic all the way to Vlicada or wherever we were going, but there was something about handling the stolen wallet ordeal the night before that put the whole wrong bus thing into a more realistic perspective. And if the bus didn't go to the marina, I'd ride it back to Fira and start again. I focused my attention back on the American, who was even better looking up close than he'd seemed from across the square the day before. He was also far younger than he'd seemed initially. Like maybe 22? 22 was way too young for anyone I would get involved with or even have a fleeting holiday flirtation with, and besides, I wasn't looking. I wondered if the cute American would be joining my sailing trip. We were the only two non-Greek people on the bus, and it didn't seem as though Vlacada was somewhere where frequented by tourists, so it was looking possible, if not likely. If he was going to be on the trip, that led to an important question. Would we become friends? I decided that if we were sailing together for the next 10 days, then yes, there was a good chance we would become friends. Unless he was a dickhead. He didn't look like a dickhead, but you can never be too sure until you actually meet a person. And even if you did meet someone and decide they weren't a dickhead, they still might be and it might take you 11 and a half months to figure it out. I knew this from experience. By the way, Neil, the cheating bastard, is the dickhead in this scenario. I dismissed the thoughts of Neil. I was getting much better at that. Instead, I let it wander to happier places as I imagined a lifetime of friendship with a cute American. After the trip, we would become pen pals, writing actual letters back and forth for years. Then we would go to each other's weddings and over the next few decades share all our major life events via letters and phone calls. During our widowed twilight years, we would live in the same city in side-by-side -side houses, all the while denying we were more than just friends. 
The bus grown to a stop at a marina. I stopped daydreaming and looked out at the dirty looked out the dirty bus window, seeing a sign that made me smile. Flicada. I was in the right place. See, no need to worry. I gathered up my stuff and got off the bus via the back door, and the cute American got off via the front door, swinging his duffel bag over his shoulder. The bus pulled away, and we were the only two people standing on the pier. We looked at each other for a moment, then I walked back towards him. I walked over towards him. Awkwardly, because my wretched backpack was swinging heavily against my leg. Hello, I said. Hi, he replied. So far, this was an excellent conversation. It seemed my witty repartee from a few hours before had completely dried up, so I figured I'd get straight to the point. Are you on the sailing trip? Oh, thank God I'm in the right place, he blurted. Then he seemed to chastise himself. He walked over to me with his hand outstretched. Hi, sorry, I was a little worried I was on the wrong bus. I shook his hand. Firm handshake. Nice. No worries. I was too, to be honest. I lied. I'm Sarah. Josh. I was right, by the way. American. I picked his accent as Midwestern, but I didn't ask. We had ten days to learn about each other, and I was sure we'd get there eventually. Shall we try to find the boat, he suggested. Good plan. My backpack was getting heavier the longer we stood there. We walked towards the rows of moored boats discussing how we would know which one was ours when Josh spotted a flag fluttering from one of the masts and pointed to it. That must be it, us. It had the tour company's logo on it, so we headed in that direction. Hang on, I said, stopping short. There's two. Look. He followed the line of my arm to another of the company's flags waving at us from a mast. Huh. Well, let's go to one. If it's not right, then we'll go to the other. Okay, by this stage, I didn't care what boat I was on. I wanted to put down my cumbersome backpack. Stupid bloody thing. We came to the first, two, first of the two yachts, which was docked parallel to the pier. It was about 15 meters long, and like most boats, the bulk of it was white. Struck me, how, struck me how little I knew about sailing and boats, as I really couldn't point out any distinguishing features. It looked like a sailboat. We both dropped our bags onto the pier, and Josh called out, Hello! A head popped out of the hatch, followed by some shoulders, then a torso and the rest of a man's body. Hello, he said back. He was handsome in the way that Harrison Ford was handsome when he played Indiana Jones the first couple of times. I couldn't help making note of how many good-looking men I was running into on Santorini. Hi, I'm Gary. Hi, Gary. Sarah, this is Josh. Gary turned around and called down into the boat. Duncan, the last tour here. To us, he said, oh, I'm not the skipper. I'm the... I'm on the tour like you, although I do know quite a bit about sailing. Oh, good to know that if the skipper falls overboard, we can keep on going, quipped Josh. <laughs> Funny. Gary offered us an unsure smile in response and joined us on deck as another head popped up out of the hatch. Josh and Sarah, said the head. Yes, we said in unison. Great. The second man, who I presume was Duncan, leapt into action. He climbed out of the hatch, jumped off the boat and onto the pier and grabbed both our bags as though they weighed nothing climbed back onto the boat and said come aboard oh and shoes off then he disappeared back below the deck he was spry i'd give him that in fact the whole exchange happened so quickly i caught myself standing and staring into a black hole where he disappeared well i guess we found the right, bo right boat josh said to me quietly absolutely i replied i slipped off my sandals and climbed over the railing onto the boat it was a little trickier than i would have liked because i was wearing a short skirt I hoped I wasn't flashing my knickers to all and sundry. I noticed with an I, no, I noticed an amused smile on Josh's face as he reached out to help. Was it smugness or chivalry? I took his hand regardless. I didn't want to fall into the water on my first day, or ever, for that matter. Gary spoke up. There's actually two boats leaving from here tomorrow morning. That's the other one over there. He pointed to the second boat that Josh and I had seen from the end of the pier. Oh, well, will will we be sailing with them? I asked. No, not really, but we'll likely run into them from time to time. All women, apparently. He laughed to himself. I think our mix of people will be far better. Hey, Josh. He gave Josh what looked like a knowing grin. What was this? The men folk conspiring already? And how were Josh and I to know what the mix was? We'd only met Gary and Duncan. Oh, God, I hope I'm not the only woman. Josh, to his credit, answered Gary with a non-committal shrug. I went below deck and Josh followed. It was so dark I couldn't see anything and then I remembered I was wearing my sunglasses so I flipped them on top of my head. I could see better but only marginally. It was pretty dark down below deck. Duncan emerged from one of the cabins and soon after two women appeared from two other cabins. I wasn't the only woman then. Gary also climbed down and then there were six of us standing in the cramped dining nook looking at each other. Oh, said the man breaking the awkward silence. I didn't introduce myself. 
Sorry, I'm Duncan, I'm your skipper. Australian, Queenslander for sure. I waved at him from two metres away. And this is Hannah and Marie, and you've met Gary, Marie's husband. So the Harrison Ford guy was married. I wasn't particularly disappointed as he wasn't really my type, a little too blokish. And besides, I wasn't looking. I smiled at the strangers I would be living with for the next 10 days. And these two are Josh and Sarah, added Duncan to finish the round of introduction. I'm Sarah, he's Josh, I added in an attempt to break the ice, and thankfully everyone laughed. Then the tiny space erupted into activity. Hannah came forward and said, hello, you're sharing with me. Uh, in there, she pointed to the left rear cabin. Come on, I'll show you. She sounded Canadian, but Vancouver, I'd guessed. I followed her the extremely short distance to our cabin and she showed me the highlights. It was a tight space, but at least we had our own bathroom. There were two bunks, one very narrow and about a metre from the ceiling, and the lower one, which took up the width of the cabin. Whoever slept on the top bunk would have to climb onto it from the bottom bunk. Some of Hannah's things were on that bunk, so I guess the lower one was mine. We also had a hatch in the ceiling and a porthole for fresh air. The cabin was tiny but clean and it would be fine. I doubted I'd be spending much time there anyway. It was just for sleeping and showering. Sarah, can I ask you a question? Sure, I said as I unzipped my backpack and started pulling stuff out. How come you're not sleeping with your boyfriend? What? I looked at her in surprise. What on earth was she talking about? Josh, how come you two aren't sharing a cabin? Oh, I said, probably loudly for the cunt confined space of a boat. I'd seen Josh disappear in the cabin next door and realised he could be listening. I lowered my voice. He's not my boyfriend. I just met him like five minutes ago on the pier. We were on the same bus to the marina, that's all, so yeah. I finished feebly. Oh, I thought you guys were a couple. <laughs> no, and believe me, if he was my boyfriend, I would want to sleep with him. Great. I sounded desperate or sex starved, or both. She gave me a funny look, confirming it was both. I'm going to head up top. Duncan's making another round of cocktails and then he's going over the trip information. I'll see you up there. What the hell was the thing I'd said about wanting to sleep with Josh? I didn't want to sleep with him. He was a baby. No, an infant. And I wasn't going anywhere near him. Even if he was cute, I wasn't going, going near any man. At most, I might admire them. And only from afar. I had to get it together. I didn't want Hannah thinking she was sharing her cabin with a nymphomaniac weirdo. Anyway, so that's from the start of One Summer in Santorini. There are three books in the series out at the moment, and there are two to come. Um, the next one is called Under Bali Skies, and that's coming at the beginning of 2022. And we're rounding out the series with a wedding in Tuscany. So there's lots of wonderful characters and um, side characters who get their own books eventually. Um, anyway, so check them out. All right, fantastic chat with Sandy, and we are allowed to say the names of her upcoming books now. So she's got The Single Girl's Guide to Hunting, which is a standalone, uh, this is the one set in the reality television. Uh, so that's fantastic. That is coming out um, soon, I think. I can't remember when, oh, August, beg your pardon. So The Single Girl's Guide to Hunting by Sandy Barker coming out in August. And another one to add to her holiday romance series is Under Barley Skies. Uh, and that one's coming out in February next year. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you so much, Sandy, for such a beautiful interview and for letting us know all about those inspirations and giving us insights into, you know, what, what drives you to write. And uh, it just sounds like there's just so much joy that you you not only get from writing, but just from the the whole idea of imagining these stories and, mm -hmm. and drawing on, her, you know, drawing on her experiences. And what a treasure chest of experiences to be able to draw upon, like having traveled so much uh, and it got me thinking too, when it comes to, in this instance, Sandy's uh, romance novels, mm -hmm. um, she, I mean, they're called travel romance, but it's almost like uh, you could, if I could pronounce this right, je mange toi. No, what's the threesome? A menage a trois. A menage a trois. <laughs> now, see, my, my very limited French in high school, I just yeah. I realised that I, I eat something. Apologies to the people of the nation of France for our, you know, butchering. Yes, my apologies, because <laughs> I did say, I think, je mange, which is eat, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, no, no, <laughs> that might go to a blueprint. But, no, I, threesome, I say in jest, but because it occurred to me, listening to Sandy, how important and vivid the location has to be as part of her writing and how much research she does. And, and that yeah. means almost as though the location is a third character. 
Oh, uh, most, in, most in the romance, yeah, yeah, most definitely. And she has such a, a vivid way of writing, and you can see if you read any of the reviews about her work, people feel like they were there, uh, and they, you know, they can smell the tomatoes in the the salad on the Greek Isles, and and that kind of thing. So yes, food is another one of her loves, which is fantastic. And Sandy's energy and her enthusiasm and her compassion and relatability spills over into you'll see in her website uh, in her social media accounts you know if you look uh, whether she's on twitter or facebook or instagram all of those places you'll see all of the joy for the things that she does and she's she's doing the job that she absolutely loves which is fantastic yeah and she's a great supporter of the australian book lovers website and podcast yeah she's been fantastic yeah it's been really great but yeah you said her enthusiasm is is off the charts and not only mm. that there's the sense that the positive energy is incredible because for you know i would think that somebody who a you know travel is a huge part of their life and then b you know she did mention that last year was supposed to be a huge travel year mm. and of course that uh, unfortunately what couldn't happen rather than you know moan about it you know it was just so refreshing to hear her say well I guess New Zealand's on the table now and uh, I'll maybe go over there and say something there. Yeah. So it's just, just adapting and, and, you know, and then realize and, and saying, Oh, well, I think I can remember, you know, enough of this place. And the, the travel is definitely in her imagination as well. And so, so and as we mentioned, she can draw, it sounds like she can draw on so many beautiful, wonderful experiences, but, but yeah, it's very, very cool interview. And uh, good, good, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And it segues me very nicely into the first quote that I have for you today. Oh, okay. All right. So this is from Catherine Mansfield. So Catherine uh, Mansfield Murray, she was a modernist writer born in New Zealand, and she wrote short stories and poetries under the pen name of Catherine Mansfield. So this is the quote. The mind I love must have wild places, a tangled orchard where dark damsons drop in the heavy grass an overgrown little wood, the chance of a snake or two, a pool that nobody's fathomed the depth of, and paths threaded with flowers planted by the mind. Yes, that's a pretty good description of uh, a mind worth loving, isn't it? Because it's wild, yes. untamed, uh, with some beautiful things to discover, but probably with a few sharp things and that can cut and a few, you know, teeth hidden in the shadows that can bite too and which is what yeah. it's all about you have to venture if you really want to uh capture that love sometimes you've got to mm. venture forth into the unknown don't you um, yeah. but that that's such a vivid descriptive quote yeah i think you'll find that kind of mind in a lot of writers yes okay give us one of yours all right i'm gonna start with a short one and then mm -hmm. i've got a bit of a long one but okay. uh this one is from none other than Jane Austen, and obviously, oh. it, because we're talking about romance, so here it is. This one is an arrow straight to the heart. It is, to love is to burn, to be on fire. Jane Austen. Whoa, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes that, that's all that needs to be said, but that is... Uh, <laughs> Um, love is to burn to be mm. yeah i guess there's no greater well there's no more vivid sensation than being on fire i can only assume i haven't been on fire but yeah as far as describing love as anything else maybe just wouldn't be enough but it's love burns and love is being on fire short sweet and to the point all right yes. let me give you one from uh annie prull p-r-o-u-l edna ann Prowl is an American, apologies uh, to this woman, she's an American novelist, short story writer and journalist. You may uh, know The Shipping News, Brokeback Mountain, both of which have been made into mm -hmm. movies, yeah. So she suggests you should write because you love the shape of stories and sentences and the creation of different words on a page. Hmm. Can you read that for me again? You should write because you love the shape of stories and sentences and the creation of different words on a page. Yeah, that's definitely someone with a whole heap of romance in their heart for the art of writing, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. And you know when you're in, that, in the flow when there's a great idea and really you're just the person holding the pen or tapping the keys because the story is just unfolding onto the page and you think oh where did that come from oh look at that oh look you know and the the words just come out and i think that's when writers love to write is when the muse or the flow or whatever it is their inspiration whatever they like to call it when they are connected and the distractions are not there 
the page is blank and waiting for them and it just pours out. Yes, well, it definitely, I think in a strange way that uh, combines with your first quote because... Um, I'm glad you saw the connection. <laughs> yes, yes, you need that imagination to, to be... And then to be able to fall in love with, uh, with, with creation, which is what writing is really. Yeah. It makes me think, you know, way back in the day when I read uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Mate. Yeah, and, I uh, read that one ages ago myself, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you can take a lot from it. And, and obviously everyone has different interpretations, but I, I remember at one point I was pretty sure what he was trying to discuss was the idea that the reality beyond our senses doesn't hold any beauty. And so there's a moment in time where our consciousness allocates beauty and therefore you know, we are the source of beauty. I think that's what he was getting at. I mean, mm. obviously there was discussion on mental illness and, and uh, the breakdown of one's consciousness as well. But, um, but yeah, that makes me think, you know, there's something magical that happens from, you know, this blood and bone and, and electricity little machine in our head. But, um, and, and as you mentioned, sometimes it feels like, you know, you're just holding a pen and it comes out, but mm. that, you know, subconscious, we, we create, somewhere inside of us the stories and then maybe in that garden in that place that you spoke of in the first quote where things can be beautiful things can be you know, dark and shady and it can be thorny it can be flowery and it can be wild and untamed but from there we we create something magical and there's this transition somewhere in there there's there's just this special magical line i think where it can, we so we create in a subconscious way then we do it consciously but then we also filter through all of our learnings and understandings of language and try and capture that essence. So maybe, mm. maybe writing is a way of turning something that may not inherently be beautiful on its own in our subconscious, but it becomes beautiful once we express it. But uh, yeah. Yes, that was always a good, good. book, that Zen <laughs> and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Yes, I must it out. It's one of those ones that I used to get a secondhand copy and uh, you know, after the first one and pass it around to people. Of course, never got it back. It would go places. And then I'd see another copy and you know, grab one of those as well. Something I also want to say about the shape of, of words on a page is I'm reading at the moment, again, apologies to all uh, people of the Wiradjuri a nation, Billa Yaradangalangare, which in English is River of Dreams by Professor Anita Heiss. And Billa Yaradangalangare is Wiradjuri for River of Dreams. And it's the first time uh, that we've had traditional language on a, uh, a commercial paperback. And what Professor Heiss has done, it has peppered the words, uh, sorry, peppered Wiradjuri words, the language throughout the book. And sometimes it's really easy to pick up what it means, but then she's also got a fabulous little glossary at the back. She explains in the book that she's just learning the language herself, having just spent a, only the last few years learning it. And it's beautiful to see the words different from English and to see the shape of them on the page. And some of them short and some of them long as they add more than a single meaning into to, you know what they're bringing to the the page so yeah it's it's fantastic i have been the editor of my first book said that i suffered from sesquipedalian loquaciousness <laughs> oh they're earning their money aren't they? <laughs> which is the love of really big words and that was that just reminded me that i just have loved seeing you know wiradjuri words in anita heiss's book but i do love big words because using words that are not necessarily your everyday looking them up seeing what sits behind them and then going yeah i can use that in a few sentences this week and then it becomes part of your language and yes uh, yeah it just brings a richness to it so there you go sesquipedalian um, which is loving long words and loquaciousness, of course, which means tend to talk too much. But there you go. Well, see, I, have, I have no bias, <laughs> Veronica. I love big words. I like yep. little words. <laughs> when it comes to my manuscripts, I like misspelled words. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, you must have one more quote for I, us. I do indeed. Um, okay, what do you got? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And uh, I mean, I, I know... I know how I interpret it, and I mean, I, th I think the interpretation speaks for itself, but at the same time, it's a, it's a little bit quirky. Um, but this quote is, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to nobody, not even an animal. 
Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Mm. From none other than C.S. Lewis. Ah, there you go. Who saves me because they at a bookstore oh, probably eight months ago now, they had some wonderfully gilded uh, hardback editions of Alice in Wonderland ah, uh, and yes. a couple of other books. So I grabbed a couple, but it's a, it's a small, small, but small hardback of the Alice in Wonderland, but with beautiful illustrations and, you know, that new, beautiful gold sort of gilding on the edges of the pages. And mm-hmm. uh, so I tucked it into my bag. It became my official work tool uh, when I started doing work for the back end for the government. Mm-hmm. And so when silliness did prevail there I, and I would just simply, that would, I did have sitting on my desk most of the time, mm-hmm. I would just happily read a page or a passage or two from Alice in Wonderland because it, it made me feel, it, it leveled things out again because yeah. uh, it actually, that felt normal <laughs> compared to what was happening around me. <laughs> it's uh, silly but fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. You know, is it a uh, hallucinogenic um, experience? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, that sounds like... A really good name for a book, maybe. Uh, ah, but that, yeah, well, <laughs> yes, but hallucinogenia. the hallucinogenia project by our very own Darren Kessinger. Yes, but hallucinogenia is it's a play on word. Well, it's not a play, it is a word, but uh, I'm not going to give it away. But let's just, let's yeah, just no say, spoilers, go yes. and buy it uh, <laughs> or yeah, look it up on Australian Book Lovers on the website. Yeah. Yes, 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 you by all means, yes. yes, but or it's not about, not about tripping. No, <laughs> there no. we go. <laughs> the short, the yeah. short giveaway. That's right. Not, not the LSD type of. Um, no, no. Yeah, hallucinogenic. No. All right. What a fabulous episode. We've had lots of news. We've had a fantastic chat with Sandy Barker and there is more to go. But before we go, I do want to say that if you are loving the podcast, we would love you to put a little review on your favorite podcast platform, be that apple or google or wherever it is or just let people know tell your friends listen to this podcast these people have lots of good things to say about books if you'd like to see us on social media we're on twitter at australian books we are on facebook and instagram at australian book lovers and you'll find us promoting our authors there um, telling you about books you'll see lots of lovely photos of our real life fairy mascot bobby who uh does his pick of the day he's been and a little bit quiet the last week or two but he, he's coming back he's he, coming back while winter he's, 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 he's been supporting me on. uh from from the couch while i've been putting together <laughs> these podcasts <laughs> you don't want to get you know too excited and of course our website is the www.australianbooklovers.com if you're looking for a great australian read jump on there and have a look absolutely and and can i just add that you know, at the core of our mission, really, as, as for yourself and myself, for Australian book lovers, one of the missions is to bring an alternative voice to authors, to give an alternative method, way, um, marketing, I guess, a, a alternative light of illumination for authors and their works. So we'd, we'd love, you know, Australian authors to get reach new readers with their books. But at the same time, with this podcast, it would be so great to also be in a position to be able to uh, offer a voice to all the wonderful book lovers out there. Because mm. if you're a book lover and you've read something fantastic, you know, uh, by an Australian author, and again, it doesn't have to be something that's listed on the Australian Book Lovers website, let us know about it. Email or record or rec- record yourself just chatting about it, whichever way, um, because your voice is powerful and that will inspire other book lovers out there that might decide to discover the book you're reading. So yeah, so ultimately we want to be the voice for both the authors and the readers. So yes. if, yeah, so if you're feeling brave or you just want to flick an email and then give us your thoughts on a book or give us your thoughts about uh, the, the the love of, of reading, sorry, and, and what it means to be a book lover, we'd love to hear from you. And that's all from us. So bye for now. Oh, we have to do, Veronica, Oh, a tagline. Damn, I forgot about the tagline. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think it's time for you to count us in. Okay, okay. So stay tuned. Still got a little bit more in time to come. But in the meantime, this, is, this should be serious, not entertaining, but uh, it will probably turn out to be entertaining. But this is our <laughs> official ending tagline. So one, two, three, 
for and remember <laughs> to read, read more, more Aussie, Aussie books. books. Oh, no. Well, we still don't do it. Yeah, I'm going to burn this recording. <laughs> I'm not a rapper. Never will be. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, so much. Take care. And we'll see you on the next or We will be with you on the next episode. All right. Bye for now. The Last Circus on Earth by B. P. Marshall A post-apocalyptic circus full of misfits, murders and mayhem are plenty. Marshall has given us a twisted tale that tells the physical, geographical and emotional journey of Blanco. He and his friends, and enemies, are part of Mr. Splinter's circus of human cargo that trapes across what's left of Earth towards a mysterious destination and Blanco's destiny. Wonderful characters, brilliant world building, added to a great plot with twists and turns aplenty. Budding romance, loyalty and betrayal. It's everything you need from a book. Add to that the author's skilled prose at weaving the weird elements together in Blanco's distinctive voice and you have a page turner. This was a great read. Let's meet again. Where magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.